Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, <clears throat> welcome. This is the first uh, or inaugural speaker of the Institute for Addiction Science speaker series. And uh, for those of you guys who don't know much about the Institute for Addiction Science or IAS, we're a new collaborative institute. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring together researchers from across six plus schools scattered uh, on the two campuses of the USC who uh, share a common interest in addiction research. And as part of this, we're trying to develop an intellectual community uh, that's right for collaboration and education. And one of our goals is to bring in outstanding speakers uh, to, to, in order to achieve that aim. And we're very, very uh, pleased and excited to have as our first speaker, Dr. Steve Higgins. And just a little bit of a, a background about Dr. Higgins. Um, I think that most people here are familiar with his work. Um, one of the things that I, I thought was interesting when I perused his CV is that uh, he actually has a degree in developmental child psychology. Um, and uh, I didn't know that, that he had kind of roots in, in developmental psych. Of course, addiction, addiction is the developmental disorder. Um, but uh, from there, Steve trained at the uh, John Hopkins Behavioral Pharmacology Research Institute, and then went to NIDA for a bit, and then has been at University of Vermont ever since. And he is really very, very well known, one of the highest impact researchers in all of addiction. Um, he's well known for developing parallel uh, programs of research in behavioral pharmacology in the lab, treatment research, treatment development research, and, and uh, more recently, uh, this decade, uh, policy research. And some of his major contributions have been in the area of behavioral economics. And I think you'll see probably that will shine through that uh, although Steve is a highly interdisciplinary researcher and works in a lot of different areas, I, I see that most of his work is motivated by a common underlying theory in behavioral economics. He's been doing it for a long time, um, uh, far before it's caught in favor more recently in, uh, in medicine, more broadly in prevention. Steve's been doing this stuff. Uh, he's won many awards, um, some of the biggest awards that you can get, uh, uh, <clears throat> like at the College of Problems Drug Dependence uh, Senior Research Award, American Psychological Association Division on Substance Abuse and Psychopharmacology. Uh, more than 300 papers, uh, a lot of them are very high impact, probably more than $100 million worth of grants, and uh, just a, a really uh, a cool guy, too. So we're really excited to have Dr. Steve Higgins from University of Vermont. Well, thanks for that generous introduction, Adam, and it's a real pleasure. I, uh, I know of the uh, USC Tobacco Regulatory Science Group, um, because we, our center, at, our uh, university has a, a, a branch in, in that same area, so we know each other. But I had never been to USC, so it's it's a blast to be here. I've had a beautiful morning. I, um, as you can see, I'm at the University of Vermont. So last night when we, when I left to come here, um, it was snow. I was in a snowstorm, so the weather. Thanks for inviting me in. Sure. Um, all right, so I'm going to, uh, you see what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to try and, uh, I like to look at my slides, but if, uh, if anybody, if I'm getting too far from the mic, just uh, please raise your hand. So I'm going to talk about uh, changing drug use and other health related behavior uh, in those with substance use disorders. Um, so all of the work that I'm going to be doing or be presenting today. Uh, requires teams. So I've been very fortunate throughout my career to have excellent faculty, collaborators, uh, pre-docs and postdoctoral uh, trainees, research staff, and general research support, and I had no conflicts of interest um, to report. So um, I have the good fortune of directing the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health, and so we uh, research relationships between personal behavior and lifestyle and risk for chronic disease and premature death. And um, substance use, cigarette smoking, 
is a big part of, of this, um, but, but not all, the only area that we research. And we're interested in both mechanisms that underpin, underpin risk for um, unhealthy lifestyles, um, but also interventions to promote healthy behavior change. So I'm um, gonna focus mostly today on uh, the interventions and treatment development. A common thread, as Adam was mentioning, is our research, a common thread across our research products is the application of concepts and methods of behavior analysis, behavioral economics, and behavioral pharmacology, um, and especially leveraging the reinforcement process to promote behavior change. That's the process that underpins much of, of these unhealthy lifestyle patterns and, and uh, the difficulty of changing them. And, um, one of the things that, that we've spent a lot of time looking at is the efficacy and cost effectiveness of financial incentives and other reinforcement based interventions um, in promoting health related behavior change. I'm going to spend, um, that's a long, in long standing interest of mine and my co uh, colleagues, and I'm going to spend a good amount of time talking about that this morning and then a little bit of additional work having to do with the current opioid um, epidemic. All right. So um, I began my work in this area back in the preceding U.S. drug ep epidemic, and it was the cocaine epidemic of the 1980s and 1990s. And some of you probably remember that, but a lot of you may not. Um, you may not have been paying attention to those kinds of things at that time. But there was a cocaine epidemic, much like the current opioid epidemic. Um, the scientific and clinical community was caught totally unprepared. I mean, at least with the opioid epidemic, we know that methadone and buprenorphine therapy are a big part of, of trying to treat that problem. With cocaine, we didn't even think it was addictive. People were singing songs about how great a drug it was and you, it didn't produce a problem, so that, that was wrong. Um, the behavioral and pharmacological treatments that people initially tried with the problem just failed miserably. And so you would look to pick up a journal to see what was going on, and, and it was not encouraging. Um, and so the, the National Institute of Drug Abuse was putting out um, calls for proposals on treatments. And um, if you, if you, as you looked at, at least my colleagues and I, when we looked at the pharmacology of, of cocaine, um, we didn't think it was likely that you were going to develop an effective um, uh, pharmacological treatment that was also specific because the drug acted uh, very much through dopamine and was likely to impact normal functioning if it was strong enough to impact cocaine use. And it's still the case today that no one has yet really solve that, that challenge. There's no efficacious farm therapy for cocaine dependence at this point. So we went in a different direction. I'm going to share that with you um, in a few minutes. Um, but in, in, in terms of relevance to, to this topic, that cocaine and amphetamine, well, first of all, they, they never, the, this high problem of, of cocaine and amphetamine addiction never went away. It just got less attention. Um, as, as years went on, but it's actually starting to make a, uh, a resurgence in the context of this opioid addiction epidemic and people who um, work in, in uh, methadone and buprenorphine clinics are now reporting that there is an emerging problem with people uh, using these psychomotor stimulants. So, <clears throat> when I started putting my slides together for this presentation, I got an email from one of my colleagues with, um, about this new meta-analysis that just came out. And um, it, I didn't even know that there was a plus meta medicine. I did, I, uh, <laughs> so that was new to me. Um, and then it was, it was on a topic that's of interest, um, this comparative efficacy and acceptability of, um, psychosocial treatments for cocaine dependence because we had spent about 20 years researching that topic um, but had moved on to other things more recently and um, so yeah so I had a look at it um, and what they, what they did was and let me say something about who they are these are um, these are um, evidence uh, 
uh, based medicine researchers. They're interested in evidence-based psychiatry in particular, and they're at Oxford. Um, and so much of, much of this work was done in the United States. So they're kind of an independent party to having a look from afar. And uh, their specialty is in these meta-analyses and not really in, in cocaine addiction. And I thought that was a breath of, air, a breath of fresh air is just to see how um, a group, that group uh, would look at this and approach it. So they, they uh, were able to identify 50 randomized controlled trials and almost 7,000 uh, participants in these trials. And they, they were comparing structured psychosocial treatments versus either another structured uh, treatment or treatment as usual. And regarding the treatment as usual, about uh, 55,000 were in one of these structured treatments and almost 2,000 in the treatment as usual. So that's, that's a pretty interesting data set. Um, and then the reason that they're focused on the psych psychosocial treatments is because without an effective pharmacotherapy, the uh, clinical guidelines are suggesting that you should offer a psychosocial treatment. And they were saying, well, there's a bunch of them out there, which psychosocial treatment should you offer? Um, so they, these are um, likely to be unfamiliar to some of you, but familiar to those who follow cocaine research, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, contingency management, community reinforcement approach, and then a number of different um, treatments. So 12 different uh, psychosocial uh, interventions and their combinations. They had some minimal criteria. The treatment had to be at least four weeks. Um, and these were the outcomes. They, were, they wanted more objective outcomes, biochemically verified abstinence, um, how well people were retained in treatment. Uh, so, so they were being fairly hard-nosed about it. Um, so here's the thing, and I'm real, I apologize, it's going to be hard for you to see all this, but there was no better graph for me to copy out of their review. So this is a forest plot, and what they're doing is um, they're going to compare these different uh, interventions against treatment as usual. And if the um, odds ratio here and the confidence interval doesn't overlap with this line, then it's significantly different than treatment as usual. And the thing that jumped out at us and the reason we were so, so excited about it is that the treatment that we developed, and I'm going to tell you about this contingency management in combination with the community reinforcement approach, was the only intervention that differed from treatment as usual across every endpoint that they were looking at. And so this first one is what uh, the odds of um, abstinence at 12 weeks into the treatment. And then this one was the odds of uh, abstinence at the end of the treatment. And then this was the odds of abstinence at the longest follow-up that was in, included in the study or in this model. And then this is could you retain people for 12 weeks and could you retain people for the recommended duration, whatever that was for, for the intervention. So um, this, this treatment is um, something that we spent a lot of time developing, and, but it's, it's something we, as I mentioned, we had moved on. So I was thinking about you guys in a new addiction center and I thought some of you must be involved in treatment development research. So when I saw the review, I thought I should spend a little time on it because even though some of that research is going to be old research, this, this um, meta-analysis that came out less than two weeks ago is saying this is the best we have at this point. So that doesn't mean it's, it's um, anything like a silver bullet, but it'd be a place that if you're, if you're challenged with disorder or, as I'll show you, if you're trying to make a contribution, as I know at least one or more of your colleagues are, to developing treatments for the opioid use uh, disorders, this treatment can be, a, can be very helpful and might be a good place to, um, to start or have a look at, a good treatment to have a look at. So this, the, uh, for one thing, there's a, a structured standardized um, therapist manual that's available free on the website of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And so this is back from when we were battling the cocaine epidemic. It, it got put up there and it's still up there. Um, and so if, you, if you're interested, you can have a look at it. I'll just give you a feel for the general treatment structure of, 
and, and the, what we were trying to get at, and then some of the studies that, that we did on it. So um, when someone presented um, for treatment with us, we recommended that they would be with us for uh, one year. The formal treatment was 24 weeks, and then it, and it was fairly intensive early on, and then we tapered the intensity. So we recommend that they come for uh, twice weekly counseling using this community reinforcement approach, which was actually initially developed for alcoholism. We adapted it for um, cocaine. And the, the theme, what you're trying to achieve with this um, counseling approach is try and teach people how to derive reinforcement from the community for healthy lifestyle choices rather than by through drugs. Because the mechanism by which drugs drive repeated use of addiction is reinforcement, but it's not the only source of reinforcement, but there are some individuals who have deficits in how you can um, access reinforcement in a healthy way. And then um, we did regular urinalysis that would allow us to detect any cocaine use um, by three times, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then we introduced this, what's now in the addiction field, very well known, voucher-based contingency management. But this was the first time that that, that was developed and, and introduced. And so if someone shows through your analysis that they hadn't used cocaine recently, we gave them these vouchers that are exchangeable for retail items. I'll give you more, more um, information on that in a second. Then the, um, the, the incentives ended after 12 weeks, and then um, we continued the counseling once weekly, the voucher based incentives, <laughs> once weekly counseling in the, in the second half of, of the 24 week treatment period, um, start uh, decreasing the frequency of your analysis. But if someone showed us that they hadn't used, now we're just giving them a $1 lottery ticket rather than these vouchers. So, um, so we're kind of tapering the intervention across the board. And then at the end of 24 weeks, we recommended that they uh, at least check in with their therapist once a month to see how things were going. Okay, so just quickly on this um, voucher-based incentive program, if you um, showed us through your urine tox test that you hadn't used recently, you would earn these points that were recorded on vouchers, just slips of paper. Um, and they, they had monetary value, purchasing power, but because it was cocaine and people used to snort cocaine through dollar bills and whatnot, so money was actually a discriminative stimulus for using the drug, we never gave them cash. And so that was the reason that we went to this voucher. Um, and so we started at low value, um, and then each time they showed us that they hadn't used, the value of the, the incentive that they would earn would increase. Um, and then if they showed us that they could go a whole week without having used cocaine, they would get like a special bonus, so another incentive. So we're just trying to, <coughs> cocaine users often use in a binge fashion, and if they present it for treatment when um, they coming off the binge, you might have a week or two before they're going back, and we're gonna try and reinforce the heck out of not using, so when the next binge time rolls around, maybe they have second thoughts uh, about using. And, um, and then if you had a, co a cocaine positive test, then you had to go back to the beginning on the cocaine, on the uh, incentive value. So we're trying to build up that they would have, be invested in sustaining abstinence in um, somewhat technical terms. What we're trying to do is differentially reinforce periods of continuous abstinence. That's, that's, that's the goal of, of drug use treatment. Um, and so if they sustained absence throughout that 12-week voucher period, they could earn just shy of $1,000. And so when we first mentioned this, the, the, the reaction of people was, you you got to be crazy to think you could get a cocaine addict to abstain from this. They're like selling their houses, ruining their marriage. This, this is a pittance. This isn't going to work. Of course, as soon as it works, then they tell you it's way too expensive to use. But that, that's <laughs> All right, so the CRA counseling, I already mentioned that the, the whole idea is to try and teach them how to get reinforcement from healthier sources, but there are more technical, like five different things we attended to, you know, the antecedents, how to avoid the antecedents of cocaine, find alternative to drug use to have positive consequences, make explicit negative, 
uh, learn how to recreate without drugs in, involved. So this is pretty intensive trying to get their lives structured in a way. We assume that everybody's vulnerable to, to enjoying drug use. What keeps the rest of us from getting deeply involved like this? And it's these kinds of reinforcers. You got a job that's inconsistent with being hungover, that, you know, from using cocaine the night before, and that sort of thing. So we're trying to get these things set up in, in the uh, cocaine uh, user's life, and we have ways that structured, validated ways called the Job Club to help unemployed get people get jobs. If they had romantic partners who weren't cocaine users, we would have to try and get the romantic partner involved and teach he or she how to reinforce abstinence. Um, if they had an alcohol use disorder, we used a drug called the sulfurum therapy. I could, I could give a whole lecture on why that's, of what that's all about. The long and short is the sulfurum therapy is an old medication that's been around for uh, alcohol problems. It essentially makes you sick if you uh, drink while you're taking the medication just because it interferes with the metabolism of alcohol. Um, but the reason we were using it with, with these guys is about um, a large proportion, the majority of cocaine dependent individuals arrive from treatment, uh, also alcohol dependent. And for many of them, even those who aren't dependent, alcohol be, will set the occasion for cocaine use. And so um, they use other drugs, for example, marijuana, but we could then document no functional relationship between marijuana use and a likelihood of using uh, cocaine, so we ignored that in the treatment. We only focus on those things that we thought had a functional relationship to the likelihood of using cocaine use. All right, so we did um, seven uh, controlled clinical trials looking at different aspects of this treatment. And then lots of the clinical lab studies uh, to ask questions about cocaine use or how some element in the treatment worked. Um, which where we started substituting cigarette smoking for cocaine use, and that actually set us up for some other studies that, that I'll tell you about. But initially, we were just doing that as a convenience. Cigarette smoking is legal. It is a form of drug self-administration. We think that there's enough commonality across drugs that you could learn things from that are relevant to cocaine from studying cigarettes. And, and, and I think that is true, and I'll, I'll show you some evidence that. All right, so we did two clinical trials that compared this treatment uh, package, if you will, versus what's already available in the community. And then we did the standard care or treatment as usual. Then we did four experiment, experiments isolating the effects of the incentive program on, on uh, being able to abstain from cocaine. And then one that isolated the effects of the community reinforcement counseling. Um, and so I'm going to take you through a sample of those studies. So the first one uh, was just a, a relatively straightforward thing that we have this new treatment package. Can it do anything better than what's being offered already in, in most communities, um, and, and I'm sure in this community? And so we compared it against a counseling approach that's um, professionally delivered, but it's based on a disease model and incorporates a lot of the concepts of AA and NA 12 steps. Um, we took 38 cocaine dependent or I should say, we got experts in this model to deliver that, and then we got experts in, in behavior therapy to deliver this one. We took uh, 38 people who were dependent, and we randomized them to get one of those two treatments, and we did six months of treatment, six months of follow-up. So here's what we, what we found. This is uh, weeks of treatment, percent of subjects who are abstinent from cocaine biochemically verified, this is the new treatment and this is the standard treatment. This is what was in the literature at this time for treating cocaine dependence in an outpatient clinic. You, you see them initially and they quickly stop coming or resume cocaine use. Or, yeah, resume cocaine use. And this was completely unexpected. And it was fun because we didn't even know what we had. Like we weren't sure, but we thought it was kind of good. And so we took this to this um, conference that Adam mentioned the CPDD, College of Problems Drug Defense, and there was a symposium in which, or a, a, a paper session, which this was like the norm, and then we had this, and it just was the big like, whoa, how do you get that? This is crazy. They don't have real addicts in Vermont. That's the only reason it is. So the question, what's the key contributor? What do you get? You're 
all in a package. And so the first one that was um, easy to separate out is this incentive program. And so we did a trial that uh, appeared in then it was archives of general psychiatry, now it's John's psychiatry. And we, we randomized people to either get the CRA plus vouchers the way I was just describing it to you, or only the CRA counseling. That's easy to find out. The question, what's this incentive program have to do with it? And this is how much can, what the average amount of continuous cocaine absence you could achieve in a recommended 24 week period if you gave them the whole thing or if you just gave them the CRA counseling and it doubled. And so it was like a definitive question in a clinical trial, like, yeah, the incentives are playing a big part. And that's what people assume, and, but that's not quite what the, the, um, the meta-analysis shows. It's the, um, the, only, the only intervention that is getting those long-term follow-ups is the CRA plus the vouchers, um, or the vouchers plus the CRA. So let, anyhow, the way the science progressed was um, these incentives were playing a big part. Um, so if you've been looked in um, the first 12 weeks when they were available, it was making a contribution then, but it was also making a contribution uh, later in the second half. Because remember the incentive, the voucher incentives ended right here. So that was, that was reassuring. And um, so then the next challenge is, are you getting the longer term effects? Is there any evidence that, that you can impact use uh, longer term? So there we um, published it, did another clinical trial, published it in uh, APA Journal, American Psychological Association, called um, JCCP, Journal Consulting Clinical Site. Um, so now what we're going to do is everybody is going to get the CRA treatment. Everybody is going to get the vouchers. And the only difference is a contingency, that in one group during those first 12 weeks, when they get the vouch, in order to get the vouchers, they have to show us they haven't used cocaine. In the other group, they will get the vouchers, but independent of whether they use cocaine. So the only thing we are manipulating in these patients is that contingency in the first 12 weeks. And we're going to follow them um, during the treatment and then one year out. Uh, beyond that. So this is, again, this mean duration of continuous abstinence. And so you, you know, these two treats, groups are being treated very similarly, um, almost identically, but you can still see pretty significant differences in how well they could sustain cocaine abstinence. So if you look at, at 12 weeks, during the 24 week treatment period, you're getting more than a two-fold difference here. All right. Then when we follow them up, um, this is six through 18 months, so the one year after treatment. This is what we call point prevalence abstinence, and this is the group that, that, um, that had the contingency, and this is the group that got the vouchers independent of the contingency only during the first 12 weeks. And every time we look, the uh, point prevalence abstinence was higher in the group that got the, um, the, the contingency compared to the group that did not. So this is point prevalence, this is continuous abstinence, and both ways you looked at it, that contingency on just that feature of the of the treatment made it a substantial difference. All right, so now is the CRA active, um, and we did a uh, another randomized trial, 100 people, and what we're going to do here is half of them are to get the full treatment CRA um, plus vouchers, and the other group's just going to get vouchers only. Um, and then we looked at drug use and psychosocial functioning. And um, I have to admit that I didn't even have a full copy of this paper available as I slapped these slides together, because I wasn't planning on going into this. But if I did, it was only seeing that meta-analysis that made me think I should spend some time on this treatment. Um, so what, what I can tell you is from the abstract, um, or what I'm summarizing here, where we delineate what significant effects there were. So if you got the CRA plus the vouchers treatment, that's significantly greater treatment retention. So that means CRA is important to that. Um, 
They use, those who got the full treatment, use cocaine at lower frequency, not the continuous absence, but the number of instances of cocaine use. Lower frequency during treatment, but not follow up. Lower frequency of drinking, remember we spent a lot of time to solve for them, that sort of thing. Um, lower frequency of drinking to intoxication during treatment and follow up compared to those who just got the vouchers only. And then the psychosocial functioning, I think, is even more important. If you got the full treatment, you have some higher frequency of days of paid employment during treatment, the initial six months. Remember, we're doing job club. Decreased depressant symptoms during treatment only. And then most importantly, I think, fewer hospitalizations and legal problems during follow-up throughout the one year compared to the voucher only. So when these guys, uh, I just want to underscore, they aren't us, like, you know, when you're at this point that you're in a clinic for cocaine, it isn't like you drank too much, like you drank five beers instead of three beers, or you did a, a line of cocaine when you shouldn't have some. They get themselves in really serious situations, and they end up in a hospital, and they end up in prison, that sort of thing. So, so having the CRA um, treatment was doing, combined with the incentives, was doing some important things to keep these guys safe and keep them out of the hospital, out of institutions, really. Um, so I think both are important. So now, while this review in 2000, the last month of 2018, you saw the years in this, is saying both are important. The field largely went after this incentive program, including me. And the CRA kind of got left behind. Not, you know, obviously there were enough to do this meta-analysis and, it, and um, investigators in Europe that were being hit with cocaine after the US did some of those trials over there and we worked with them in Spain in particular. But anyhow, this CM, um, this voucher-based approach, got really got a lot of uh, research attention. And so um, we, we did reviews because we were, we were interested. We came up with this idea. And so every few years, we would look uh, and do a review to see what was going on with this um, intervention in, in, in treating substance use disorders. Because it's, it's used to treat some other kinds of problems as well. So we did a, a one in the years you can say and see here, and then that covered, I think, 13 years. But, Long and short across these three reviews, the last one that came out in 2016, um, we covered 24, 24 years of, of research. And so the, the, this is a forest plot from the first review. And the thing that jumped out at us is that people had extended it to a lot of other drugs. And it was working with, with all of them. You could get abstinence from a wide variety of drugs. Remember I was mentioned that we would do little studies on nicotine, figure out well, what we could learn with cigarette smoke would teach us something about cocaine. And I think we're right. And this shows you, you take what worked with cocaine and you could get control over a wide variety of different abused drugs. Um, and so in this plot, remember, if it doesn't overlap with zero, you're getting a, significant, a statistically significant improvement in the odds of abstaining. And the only one that overlapped with zero was alcohol because there was only a single study and it was, so it was a variance estimate was large. Um, all right, so across the 24 years, we brought 176 controlled studies published in peer-reviewed journals looking at some variation of that voucher-based incentive program and 151 or 86% were statistically significant treatment effects. Um, that, it, for dealing with a problem like substance use, that, that is a heck of a lot of evidence supporting its efficacy. So um, if, if those intrigued, interested in treatment development, I think it's important thing to keep in mind. All right, so the other thing that, um, that I just wanted to mention is uh, we had no idea that this opioid epidemic was going to happen. But um, I had a, we, there were three investigators at the University of Vermont who were working on addictions, and we chopped, we worked together across the drugs of, of abuse, but we chopped the world up by drug abuse. So John Hughes, had, he was the primary guy on tobacco, I was the cocaine guy, and Warren Bickle was the opioid guy. And so um, we 
looked at the same CRA vouchers treatment um, for opioid use disorder in the context of uh, what we call an extended detoxification using buprenorphine. And I won't go into details, but it worked beautifully. So um, I think, again, if I know one of, at least one of your colleagues is wrestling with treatment development for the opioid use epidemic, and I think this treatment can potentially be. All right, so I was in, among the crowd that just went after the vouchers and left CRA behind, which I feel a little sad about, truthfully, because it's a great treatment, and it's actually also a good treatment without the voucher, just CRA counseling. It's very good for adolescents as well, and there's been a lot of trials. That's one area where people kept running with CRA um, during the 2000s, and there's some good evidence uh, supporting its efficacy with adolescents with drug use problems. So I went in the direction of what's another population where people are really struggling to get any control over their behavior, like the, was the case with the cocaine users. And so um, pregnant cigarette smokers, which at first, if you don't know the population, might think, wow, that would sound like a much easier population to work with than illicit cocaine abusers, but not the case. They are very difficult to get to quit. So I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you, um, tell you. So it's a serious public health problem. It's the leading preventable cause of poor pregnancy outcomes in developed countries. Um, and in the US, about 22% of US women of childbearing age are regular smokers, and about 13% uh, of pregnant women are smokers. Hugely influenced by socioeconomic class. I'm sure there aren't many cigarette smokers. There might be one, but there are not many cigarette smokers in this group, highly educated group. But if you look at people with a GED, it might be more than 40%. More than um, so if a smoker, they're more likely to be disadvantaged anyhow to be a smoker, but um, about one third of smokers, as soon as they find out that they're pregnant, we've actually looked at how quickly they quit. They put down their cigarettes almost as soon as they get their pregnancy results. And they're very good at sustaining absence through the pregnancy and early postpartum. But there's two thirds of them who keep right on smoking. And they're the ones that, that you really have to try and do something for. So people have been trying. The first controlled study was reported in 1984 in JAMA. And so it was a very nice study, first uh, controlled study on this problem, smoking during pregnancy. And um, they did a very intensive multi-component treatment, sort of like what we did with cocaine. Like, let's just throw everything at them. They, uh, they had counseling, home nurse home visits, educational materials, follow-up calls, and they got a very nice treatment effect. They cut overall the entire group, smoking by half, and they increased the um, mean birth weight by you know, a not insignificant amount compared to the usual care control group. So this set the field up beautifully to do something good on this, on this problem, except all the subsequent research didn't do this. They went with very brief interventions, low-cost interventions. Let's get things that could be done when they come for their obstetrical care, their prenatal care. And the treatments, they're all, they have terrible effects. They don't work very well at all. And uh, less than 10% of the trials report a significant um, treatment effect at the trial level. And only one um, of the trials that was done subsequent to this one impacted um, birth outcomes. So there's a group in Australia that does periodic um, reviews on this on this um, challenge, this problem, and what's what's being learned about how to, to decrease smoking in pregnant women. Um, and, and every couple of years they do one. So they did one in these two times that are both looked at 70 controlled trials, 25,000 women. Um, and at a meta level, you could detect that the treatments, some pharmacological, some behavioral, different types, were producing an effect, but it was a relatively small magnitude. It could increase absence rate in late pregnancy by about 6%. So the, there was an exception. There was financial incentives. And instead of 6%, you were getting 24%, so fourfold greater. And, um, and all it was is what I just told you about the cocaine-dependent population extended to the pregnant women. And you can 
change the outcome. So this is a, um, a meta-analysis of um, studies on, on that problem using financial incentives. And it was this uh, Cahill et al. did a Cochrane review on uh, incentives for smoking cessation in the population generally. And they have a subsection that's specific to pregnant women, and that's where this figure is from. And so it's looking at the odds of um, being abstinent at the late end of pregnancy um, assessment. These are individual studies. These are three trials we did. And then other people are using the intervention as well. As you can see, um, not you know some overlap with zero, but many of them not. And the um, overall in, uh, change in odds is almost four fold increase in the odds of abstaining if you got the incentives it versus any some kind of control treatment. Um, so what I'm going to do is take you quickly through how we do them at the University of Vermont. There's slight variations in how people, how often they're given the incentives and what whatnot. So um, this is a review that we published a few years ago where we reviewed how we did we um, treat this problem and, and what we were finding. So the results I'm going to show you are from 100, oh, sorry, 166 women, and um, <coughs> most of them come from uh, local obstetric practices or WIC programs in the greater Burlington area. <coughs> um, everything is from controlled trials. Majority is Vermont, uh, so it's almost all to uh, Caucasian population, maybe 93, 4 percent. Um, relatively young, unemployed, no health insurance, less than or equal to 12 years of education. So we've actually compared the um, social demographics of this population against our cocaine using population, and they are just more disadvantaged. So it's really a uh, smoking and during pregnancy has really settled into. A group that's um, very disadvantaged in, in, in a way it's, it's a little sad. So um, the voucher condition, you'll know this from the cocaine. So this is that, remember that trial where everybody got incentives It said in one group that you, you had to show us that you didn't use recently in the other group, you still got the incentive, but um, independent of your smoking status. So that's the basic design of the study. The, um, Objectively verified smoking status, we use that same escalating schedule with the resets. Um, if we pick up the women usually towards the end of the first trimester and we follow them through the, uh, the three months postpartum. And so the results, the, it, during that period, if they were absent throughout, they could earn almost $1,100 in purchasing power. But the re results, because we don't get all of them with um, the results I'm going to show you are obtained for about $461 in, in incentives. Um, and then whatever providers, obstetricians, or primary care providers are doing in the way of uh, trying to help the women quit, we just leave that, that alone. All right, so um, this is the late pregnancy um, smoking status. So in the contingent, non-contingent, you've got a, in our this set of data a five-fold difference in percent of women who are abstaining from late pregnancy. And then uh, we run it out through 12 weeks postpartum. So the, the, as you get further away from delivery, uh, women who had been absent are starting to resume smoking, but uh, you still have a nice treatment effect. And in this study, even three months later, you can see a big difference. That doesn't always happen. We have a trial going now where it's a cost effectiveness study, and we're doing it against usual care and we aren't getting this large a difference. So I just think it's a real difference, and, but you have to have a large sample, and the estimate's gonna vary around if you have a smaller sample um, to, get, to get an accurate estimate. But um, this part has not varied, so I showed you the Cochrane um, review, and I'm gonna show you this. All right, moving to US opioid epidemic. So our center's been involved in uh, trying to respond to this. Um, you know, the epidemics don't start, they, they get publicity suddenly, but they don't start suddenly. 
So when we first got our center going and our um, start our careers at the University of Vermont, there was no um, medication treatment for opioid dependence in the state. So if you were opioid dependent, and there were some, and, and we could tell it was growing, they would have to go to another state in order to be treated. And so they would trans, um, they would go back and forth between the other states. They would commute um, daily for methadone, and we didn't have. Uh, buprenorphine offered at that time. So we got that going in Vermont, and then um, as this started to, this, the prevalence of opioid dependence started to grow, um, we assisted in trying to increase the availability of met methadone, uh, medication assisted tr treatment. <coughs> I should say, I don't know how many of you are familiar, but um, for opioid addiction, it's pretty much, uh, among scientists, there's consensus you need to be doing an opioid substitution therapy. There's some small percentage of population you can treat otherwise, but the safest assumption is you need to do methadone-assisted, or medication-assisted therapy, it's called MAT. And so um, Vermont and many other states, including rural states especially, but large states like California, where you have rural sections like North, Northern California, we're um, really trying to get medication-assisted treatment available. Um, and so we've been working on that. Um, we've been um, very active in developing a model called the Hub and Spoke Network, and I'm going to tell you more about it, that um, helps to expand this medication-assisted treatment. And, um, about that. Um, and then we've been researching how to improve other challenges in this population. And the one that I'm going to um, zero in on is how to reduce unplanned pregnancies. And I'll say more, but you don't, it's not a good thing when a opioid dependent woman gets pregnant because then the fetus is exposed to the infection. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to touch on three studies. The hub and spoke care for opioid use disorder that um, Vermont developed and we're exporting to other states. When you, through, in Vermont early on, still a little bit, but not so much, there are wait lists for treatment for opioid dependence. And so opioid dependent individuals will not stop using if you put them on a wait list. And so it's almost unethical to do this in ter terms of the implications, but many states are unprepared, especially in these rural states. They don't know what to do, so somebody is, uh, um, appears and, and, and asks for treatment, they get put on these wait lists, they might be on for months or years even, and, um, and that puts them at great risk for infectious disease, <coughs> overdose, um, uh, crime, and so even as we try to um, expand treatment, we also wanted to do something for these wait lists. And so that's what this study is going to be about. So you'll see. And then um, this is the, the study on the um, preventing pregnancies. All right, so what is the hub and spoke model? So um, Vermont was not unique, but it, it in um, being impacted tremendously by this epidemic. And uh, early in the 2000s, our governor, you may have heard about it, did a state of the state address in which he focused only on the opioid epidemic. And he said, this is the biggest thing going on in our state. And I think it was true for other states as well, but he, he was willing to stand up there and say it. And it led um, people in this state to start figuring out what are we going to do about it. So the um, Commissioner of the Department of Health and the Medicaid Office joined um, forces in, in putting this idea uh, with the input of the addiction experts in the state of an integrated care model. And so the idea was that you divide the state into these catchment areas, and um, within each area they have a central opioid <coughs> treatment center. So we're actually borrowing this from other areas of medicine where you have hubs of expertise who can work with primary care doctors who are out in the spokes. Um, 
And so, uh, and in these centers, they would be experts in providing methadone, buprenorphine, sometimes naltrexone, not that often. They're going to be the hubs. And then each hub is connected to a network of medical providers who get, this is jargon a little bit, but they get a waiver on the undergo training to learn how to prescribe buprenorphine in a, pri in a primary care setting. And so they're going to be the spokes. And what uh, the theory, and, and we're actually uh, putting it in, in, in practice, is a person comes in and they get referred to the hub for evaluation and initial stabilization on the, on the um, medication-assisted therapy. And then um, the complex cases will re remain in the hub, uh, but those that are stabilized and seem to be pretty, doing pretty well, they get moved out into the spokes. But the, to reassure the doctors who aren't familiar with <coughs> addiction and you know, opioid addicts, we reassure them that if somebody destabilizes, they can come back to the hub. So it makes it more likely that they'll, they'll get the waiver and that they'll accept these, these patients. Um, and so I'll show you how it's allowed us to dramatically increase treatment capacity. So this is a study that uh, Brooklyn and Sigmund published and just looking at three uh, years in Vermont. And these are the different catchment areas. And across these three years, the uh, census in, in the clinics. And you can just see this dramatic increase in each of these um, hubs um, in, in the number of patients being treated. And, um, but yeah, so it's been, it's been a real success and we're now trying to, you know, still fine tune it, we're trying to export it. And one of our colleagues is, like I mentioned several times, working with people in Northern California to, to use the same system. Um, but during this period, there are people sitting on waiting lists in Vermont too. So um, Stacy Sigmund developed this um, uh, method to um, effectively bring um, treatment to the people in the waiting list. Um, so she devised what we're calling an interim care protocol and here, rather than have somebody on a wait list, you, you could see them once every two weeks, which wouldn't be too much demand on the clinic, in one of these hub clinics, the expert clinics. They take the dose of buprenorphine under observation in that clinic, and then they receive two weeks worth of medication, take home doses in this device that Stacy found, I think, I don't know where she found, it's in Sweden or something that it was first developed. But it, it was a, a secure device that allowed her to put a two weeks supply in there, and it's not easy to tamper with. Um, then she had additional safeguards where she would randomly call people back, and you had to bring your dispenser in there and show that you haven't been doing anything with it um, to, to, to undermine the um, idea of taking them just one dose a day. Um, and then she did a randomized uh, efficacy. Trial. Just took 50 patients that were on a wait list and randomized them. Half would go into this interim uh, treatment, or half would continue on the wait list. And the results were, were dramatic and um, got published in New England Journal of Medicine. So, this is the people that got the interim buprenorphine. These are the guys that remained um, on the wait list. This is um, uh, participants who were abstinent from illicit opioids. So you can see, you know, at intake when everybody was on the wait list, nobody's abstinent. You, you bring a medication and you get a dramatic increase up here. You're almost getting 100% absence. And the guys that continued on the wait list kept using illicit opioids. And then another way of looking at is number of days of drug use in the past 30 days. Again, almost 30 when they're, they're not getting any medication. You give these guys the medication, illicit opioids drops dramatically leave them on a wait list and keep right on, on using. And then um, number of days of intravenous use, which is really a risk for overdose and, um, and, and infectious disease. Um, a lot of it when, when they're uh, on the wait list, give these guys the medication and get dramatic reductions. All right, so the last study I wanna cover here is what can you do about the unplanned pregnancies in, the, in this population? So this is just one, like an example of kind of major needs um, these populations often have. 
So about 45% um, of pregnancies in the U.S. overall are unplanned. And uh, Sarah Heil, my colleague, leads this. So I, I didn't really know this, but apparently the unplanned pregnancies cost a lot more than planned pregnancies. So they're associated with problems. Um, and it's estimated to be about 11 billion per year. When you look at the opioid um, population, whether they're in or out of treatment, 80% of them are not using contraceptives. Or 80, I'm sorry, 80% of them are, 80% um, of the pregnancies are unplanned. Um, it's well documented. And there's the problem of the neonatal accident syndrome. So they have the unplanned pregnancy, um, they're opioid dependent, the infant gets pregnant, or the infant becomes dependent, and often needs special treatment. So the cost of that is, is um, it's enormous, and this fellow Patrick estimated what those costs are. Um, so uh, the goal of Sarah's work is just to get the women to use a medically effective and recommended uh, contraceptive. Ideally, it would be a long-acting reversible um, contraceptive. And um, so she had, uh, she has a trial going now that's uh, the evidence, not the evidence. So there's a usual care control condition, and what they do, these are, um, they come to the opioid um, substitution clinic to get their medication for their addiction, and they get um, told about contraception options um, and a referral to a local provider. What I, what I skip, and I should say, is the women were selected because they um, are currently sexually active, they are um, not planning to get pregnant, and they are not using a medically approved contraceptive. So that's like a bad combination. You don't want to get pregnant, you're sexually active, you're not using a contraceptive. Um, and so these guys come to the clinic, and the nurses talk to them and give them a referral. Getting the referral is more than is typically going on in clinics these days, but at least this would be you know, a reasonable thing to do. Um, then the World Health Organization has a protocol for how you can improve uh, use of, of medically approved contraceptives. And what you can do is have them available on site at the time that you interact with the woman. You don't you need to do a full physical exam. You can do a brief medical history. And apparently experts in, know how to do this. You can eliminate certain contraindications. If they're not present, you can start the woman right then. Um, and so that's what this is, this group gets. And then this group gets that same, these first two, well this, this, plus they get incentives that um, during the follow-up period, which is going to be six months, they receive a voucher if they stop in and talk to the staff, just take the time to talk to the staff about any side effects they're having with the contraceptive. Uh, the voucher is not for using a contraceptive, you could get this, you could not use one and still get your voucher, but you're stopping and talking about what's going on in the country. All right, so um, just a referral out, the opportunity to get a, a contraceptive and to check in, but, but no incentive for checking in. And this group gets the opportunity to get a contraceptive at the clinic. And then also incentives if they're willing to check in with the staff, with the nurse, when they come about any side effects. And the max they could earn is $390 in incentives over six months. So the effects are um, pretty dramatic. So um, six months and 12 months, so six months that are mentioned, and this is the follow-up period, you get these nice graded effects. So the proportion of women using a uh, recommended contraceptive, 71% if you do the full package, 51% if you do the who in it, World Health Organization intervention and only 11% with uh, usual care. And then if you verify the abstinence, I, I don't even know what the protocol is, but uh, it, um, you can verify that they're, they're using their contraceptive. You get the same functional relationship. Then this is the slide that I'll end on. It's really my favorite slide of the decade or something. Um, this is pregnancies in the six month incidence pregnancy in the six months that, of the study. Usual care, only 3% of these women are pregnant during the study. 
Um, if you use the who, uh, it goes down to 17%. If you use the full protocol, 5%, almost a five-fold difference, four to five-fold difference, by uh, just incentivizing them to check in about side effects. All right, so um, there's just to wrap up, a bus support for CRA plus incentives and incentives alone for changing substance use disorders, reducing drug use, staying in treatment. The um, incentive-based models provide substantially better smoking cessation treatment on pregnant women than current clinical practices. We can't use the knees. We should be using the incentives, in my opinion. I think the evidence is there. Um, Financial incentives have not been widely integrated into the community substance use um, treatment clinics. Um, although there have been inroads made, the VA healthcare system is using them, um, and private sector employee wellness programs often use them. Vermont's <coughs> making substantially substantial headway in, in meeting treatment demand for the current uh, opioid epidemic, um, and I think that is potentially be helpful to other states. So we. Our center would be happy to work with anyone in your center that's, that's interested in this problem, trying to do something about it. Um, and then the last one is, um, I think us experts in substance use disorders should consider being stronger advocates for um, more evidence-based substance use disorder treatment and prevention interventions, because these are not minor things. People die by providing inadequate care unnecessarily, or get pregnant, or get pretty serious um, uh, adverse life outcomes. And I think sometimes, and I include it, this is much speaking to myself as anyone knows, I think sometimes we're, we're a little um, uh, too soft on the policymakers about this. And the problem is with other kind of health conditions, like HIV would be a great example, there are strong advocacy groups that will speak up on behalf of the patients illicit drug abusers in particular, but now that smoking is settled into the disadvantaged population, they don't have strong advocacy groups. So I think the only ones that are really going to advocate for them are us on this topic. So I'll wrap up there. Thanks. Well, I think, 
I think that's a good idea. I, um, I think you'd probably find a little bit in the literature on, on efforts in that regard, but nothing that's really developed. Um, and then, you know, you also have the, the issue of, um, for once they're deep into this illicit drug use, it isn't always like a clear, okay, today I went and I go to my um, dealer and I lay out 50 bucks and then I get this much cocaine. There's like, people are sharing, people are, you know, so more often than not, they're paying it out, but it's messy. And I think that's also probably a factor. So they, they you know, we might help them like, not make the transaction save the 50, but they're still taking hits on someone else's crack pipe, which then, you know, interferes with self-regulatory processes. So, um, so you know, you know it's, it's that kind of stuff. And I think in this context of treatment, and, and uh, like I hinted at a couple of times, all the experience I have, I would use the CRA and the the incentives together, and um, and I think it's in that context where you can get control with some of that stuff where you're not, it's not so transactional, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm curious if you, with the study populations, if you looked at motivation, um, <clears throat> or did any kind of evaluation in relation to the level of readiness or motivation for people and how that impacted it. And then also, did it? Did you look at people who had uh, co-occurring disorders? And is there any difference in that population utilizing this model? Yeah. Um, so I think we've done some of that. So what? let me speak to what I know. The cocaine, the um, pregnant cigarette smokers are striking that the mean score is only like on a one to four is like 3.99 in how much do you want to quit smoking. But the population is still smoking when they prevent the prenatal, uh, first prenatal care visit, um, just can't seem to get it done. And so I don't know that it's so much that they aren't, that they don't want to do it, but they, without the incentive which somehow structures they don't seem to get it done. Um, and then some of them even with the incentive because you know we're getting 35% so the control group makes us look, <laughs> the and that's the usual care. It's awful, the usual care, like right now our community is as bad as the control data that I was showing you now. So they make us look good, 35 versus 7%, but that means that um, there's 50, what, 65% of them are still smoking, um, so, yeah, so that much I know. We have looked at like what plenty of times what predicts who's going to do well, say against the cocaine in the cocaine population and whatnot. And it's um, it's often counterintuitive. People assume that it's going to be the most disadvantaged population. The only reason they're going to respond to the incentive is because they're so poor, just a chance to get a couple extra dollars or something. But it's usually the opposite. People who um, or employed people who have more education. So it's once I reflect on it, then I think, well, geez, that's how, that's what you're asking. Like, who's going to be most effective at working to get this incentive? Well, people who are kind of effective at working towards incentives, you know. Whether, so that's that's kind of how it works, and um, it, I find it helpful in that it gets you to think about these things a little differently. You know, people make choices about. It the kind of stuff John was talking about, just forces you to think through some things. So um, I think the incentive program, I'm sure it's some, like depending on how we're defining motivation, it's it's helping to motivate people, but I think it's more it's more like providing a concrete, short-term, positive reinforcer of the same, like, it's going to affect the same brain centers as smoking. Uh, right here, if you make this choice versus that choice, boom, you get it. Um, and 